Bill Lewis is a computer scientist and has worked in research and taught most of his life, most recently doing genetic research at the Broad, rhymes with Broad, the Broad Institute of MIT. He has taught at Stanford and Tufts universities and worked for several large corporations, including FMC, Sun Microsystems, and Nokia. He is an Eagle Scout, returned Peace Corps volunteer, and a member of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Today he will be speaking as James Madison, the fourth president of the United States. The president will be expressing his concerns about democracy, his concerns in 1790, and how those concerns also echo today. From the storytelling manual, speech number five, bringing history to life, speaking for 10 to 12 minutes, or? How long do we have? Do you want? We have up to 20, if you need it. I hope you're not bored. <laughs> this is a rare treat, usually a five to seven, but 20 minutes with oh, we'll James do Madison. 15 to 20, sir. 20, if we okay. can. Okay. Bringing history to life, speaking for up to 20 minutes in a speech entitled, Madison on Money. Please welcome Bill Lewis as James Madison. United States Capitol Police Force knows who I am. Ladies and gentlemen, most honored guests, I am James Madison, of course, the fourth president of the United States. Perhaps I should speak a little bit louder. It was well known that I was a very soft-spoken individual, but I shall attempt for your sakes to speak with a bit more volume. <clears throat> Of course the Capitol Police Force knows who I am. I told them this past April when I was in Washington, D.C., I spoke to hundreds of policemen telling them the same thing. Now, you may be curious as to the reasons I should return after 180 years of quiet repose in the grave. The answer is that I am terribly concerned about the democracy of my country. I have seen, particularly over the past half century, all of those things which we fought so hard for to build a more democratic country fall by the wayside. I'm very concerned about the future, both our country and our world. As Virginians, we were always chary of oppressive power from any source. When Alexander Hamilton proposed a national bank, we were the first to oppose it. How can you trust a man who does nothing but push papers and bills and does nothing productive for society whatsoever? And the idea that a corporation could outlast the very men who created it is an abomination. As I said in the day, there is an evil which ought be guarded against in, in the indefinite accumulation of property from the capacity of holding it in perpetuity by corporations. The power of all corporations ought to be limited in this respect. The growing wealth acquired by them never fails to be a source of abuses. And so that is why I am here. And that is why I joined with 10,000 other loyal, patriotic Americans to in D.C. to protest our loss of freedoms. Now, I could have not have done this without the able assistance of Mr. Bill Lewis, so I shall let him introduce himself for just a minute. <laughs> My name is Bill Lewis. I consider myself to be conservative in the traditional sense of the world, like uh, Eisenhower was a conservative. I'm concerned with personal responsibility and governmental transparency. 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 <clears throat> a year ago, I was in protest against corp corruption in the government with the New Hampshire Rebellion. I was asked to wear a costume and deliver some lines in a little skit that they were doing, and I said, I can do that. And the response that I got from people was amazing. Individuals who would pay no attention to Bill Lewis whatsoever were very intrigued to talk to President Madison. So when friends of mine said, 
Let's march from Philadelphia down to Washington, D.C. to protest the corrupting influence of money in politics. I said, sure. And when they said, bring Madison along, I said, sure. And so, 100 of us marched from the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia down to the Freedom Bell in Washington, D.C. and spent the next week sitting on the Capitol steps being arrested by the Capitol Police in an act of civil disobedience. Our intention was to bring attention to the corrupting influence of money in politics. As you, I hope you know, this is how Congress works. You get elected, and the very first thing you are concerned about is your next election. And so, our Congress people and our senators spend four, six hours a day in little rooms making telephone calls to wealthy potential donors begging for money and then passing laws that they maybe didn't really want to pass in order to get that money. And we call that bribery and corruption, and we want to change that. And that is what our forebears fought for, and we are going to change that here. <clears throat> By 1790, we had accomplished most of our goals in creating a nation. We had, through many painful compromises, ratified the Constitution, established the federal government as supreme in issues of commerce, international trade, and international relations. Our major concern was that our 13 states would remain in a loose confederacy begin to squabble, and then go to war, just as every other confederacy in the history of the world has done. And that was our greatest fear. None of us, not Washington, not Hamilton, not I, were completely satisfied with the results. But our worst fears had been assuaged. We were a country. Washington accepted the presidency with some reluctance, as he thought that he should soon die and he wished to return to his farm, his plantation, Mount Vernon, and pass his days in quiet solitude. But he was the only person in the entire country which every single person respected and loved and admired. And when we put him up for election, virtually every man and woman who voted in 1788 sent their electors to put down a vote for George Washington. And the electoral, in, in the Electoral College, George Washington was unanimous elected president. This then was a happy situation in the fall of 1790. A country, a president, and a location for our capital. That's when Colonel Hamilton, whom Washington had most reasonably appointed to be Secretary of the Treasurer, proposed a national bank, a private national bank. I want to emphasize my respect and admiration for my close friend, Colonel Hamilton. It was he who pushed us and inspired us to build the nation, to have the con uh, Congressional Conference in uh, Philadelphia, which allowed us to build the country that we have. It was Colonel Hamilton who invited me to participate in the writing of the Federalist Papers to push the states to ratify this Constitution. So I have nothing but great admiration for the man. But the thought of a privatized bank having control over the minting of coins and the printing of money filled us all with fears. We had worked so closely and I admire so much, but this caused a rift which was never resolved. He had his logic <clears throat> that loans in the time of public danger, especially from foreign war, are found to be an indispensable resource even to the wealthiest of them. And on the one hand, the necessity of borrowing, in particular for emergencies, cannot be doubted. 
So, on the other hand, it is equally evident that to begin to borrow upon good terms, it is essential that the credit of the government should be well established. But still, a national bank? It is the very antithesis of our new Republican government. Jefferson and I were aghast and set ourselves immediately to the task of opposing it to the best of our abilities. Let me be clear about the matter. <clears throat> History records that money changers have used every form of abuse, intrigue, and deceit and violent methods possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. Jefferson concurred. I believe that the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a monetary aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The, issue of, the issuing power of money should be taken away from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Jefferson's concerns might seem excessive to your modern ears, but I challenge you. Tell me about recessions. Within a recession, what happens? We have insufficient money to buy the things that we need, of course. And how is it that we have insufficient money? My tobacco crop is still growing very nicely. Mr. Adams still likes to use his snuff. I am still thirsty. I still wish to purchase his fine ales. And yet, all of a sudden, we are unable to do the fundamental in interchange of commerce. Our entire system of commerce has foundered upon the use of money. So, money, we think, as a means of exchanging, it becomes a hindrance to that very exchange in commerce. History has seen recession as a growing impediment to freedom and economic excess. We suffered our recessions, 1796, 1815, and um, let's see, ah, in your day, there was another in 1857, 1873, 1895, 1907, 1929. Oh, that was a larger one, 1929. Ah. And I see that your Congress acted to prevent the bankers from further speculating with the public's money by writing the Glass-Steagall Act, which seems to me a very appropriate thing. And in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you had no major recessions. 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, no major recession. Why? It seems like you may have conquered this very demon. And then... 1999, your President Clinton signed into law the repeal of Glass-Steagall. That seems unwise to me. And eight years later, amidst extensive speculation by your banks, the economy once again collapsed, and all of your major financial institutions went bankrupt, and then you bailed them out. You bailed out the very banks and financial institutions that threw you into recession, and you left the men responsible in charge. Not a single one of the criminals went to jail, and yet you allowed them to foreclose on the homes of four million Americans. So you took the tax monies from four million Americans and you gave it to your richest and most powerful individuals. This is not the country that we worked to establish. Your government intentionally drove the common man into poverty. All that we fought for, all of our blood, our struggle for freedom, has become but a footnote in that glorious history of the rich and powerful. The very things that we fought against have now taken over your country. America was once the richest, most egalitarian, most democratic society in the world. And you have allowed it to fall 
into an oligarchy without lifting a finger. I see that less than 40% of eligible voters voted in 2014. I am depressed. James Madison might be depressed. Bill Lewis is angry. That is not what our country should be. That is not why I'm a Republican. That is not why I came and worked to establish a more just union. So what Bill Lewis is doing, he's spending his time up registering people to vote. He is spending his time talking about the issues which affect all of us the most, the issues of money and who controls it. What, my friends, are you going to do? Mr. Postman. Thank you very much.